Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 4th of December, 2012, and Stacy Roshan and Shane Lavellet are joining us to talk about flipping the classroom. I actually almost wanted to call this flipping the flipped classroom. We'll talk about why in a minute. Welcome, Stacy and Shane. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having Glad us. Here. Delighted that you are. This is uh, a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to Mighty Bell for support and to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this terrific technology. I am on the Hack Your Education tour. I'm currently in Phoenix, Arizona for the last leg of the fall part of the tour, fall winter part of the tour. So if you're in Phoenix, come join us on Friday night and Saturday. More information at hackyoureducation.com. We've had a lovely year of conferences. Um, in August, we had the Learning 2.0 virtual conference, and uh, then we had Library 2.012 and the Global Education Conference. These were massive, I call them the other MOOCs, massive online open conferences, a lot of peer professional development by teachers teaching each other. The, all of the sessions are recorded. I think there are close to 750 sessions up on a variety of fun topics and lots of great keynote addresses. We are announcing this month a school leadership summit for March of next year uh, that will be sponsored by TCAL. And then Hewlett Packard is sponsoring a worldwide STEM conference in April. And then uh, there is the Reform Symposium in May and a homeschool conference also in May. Should be lots of fun. <laughs> anyway, lots of good stuff coming up. Coming up on the future of education, tomorrow Gina Bianchini, a co-founder of Ning, talks about her new program, Mighty Bell. This is a sponsored program. I do consulting work for her. It is a great program. It's worth finding out about. Ray McNulty will talk to us about his book, It's Not Us Against Them, Creating the Schools That We Need. December 12th is the Edge Blog Awards. Cal Newport comes back on the 13th to talk about his new book on why skills trump passion, which should be fascinating. He's been on the show before. He's a delightful guest. And it would be interesting to hear his take on that. Adam Fry will talk to us about EdTech entrepreneurism. Adam is one of the co-founders of Wikispaces, and we've had this conversation, he and I, for years now, about uh, what, it really, what, what schools really need from the entrepreneurial arena. And he has lots to say on it. David Risher from worldreader.org. And then we're finally, finally going to dive into Edwards Deming. Uh, we're going to talk about Deming Virtual Communities and Organic Self-Organizing Schools with Gary Obermeyer. Coming up in 2013, John Hattie, Elliot Washer, Michael Fullen, Howard Rheingold on his new Pyragogy project, Andy Hargraves and Dennis Shirley on the Global Fourth Way, and a show on agency and education. Can't wait. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded. Jim Groom was a delightful and controversial guest last week, uh, talking about a domain of one's own. If you're interested in that at all, don't miss it. And by domain, Jim means more than just your web presence. He also means the data and everything that you should own, but probably don't on the web. Charles Hayes talked to us about self-directed learning. Kiran Birsetti came in from India to talk about her programs there and uh, helping students take charge. Anyway, lots of fun, over 300 sessions now, and they're all up and available for free. So this is where you get to tell us where you're listening from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. Just the second one down. You can click on it. And click again. And if you click on the map, it will indicate where you're listening from. Please do feel free to shout out in the chat. Let us know the time and the temperature. Someone from Brazil, Australia. As regular listeners know, I lived for a year in Brazil when I was in high school as an exchange student. And I always love seeing that dot show up in Brazil. So in the, we're going to move on, but keep letting us know in the chat where you're from. Looks like um, India, or sorry, uh, Europe as well. And then there was a dot over by China. but. Hong Kong, Taiwan, lovely. Great to have you here, wherever you're participating from or if you're listening to the recording. We're really glad that you've chosen to join us. 
So this is a show that I have wanted to do, Stacey and Shane, for a long time. And Shane, in the interest of full disclosure, let's talk about your commercial association. This is not a sponsored show, but uh, I think we should make that clear up front who you work for. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure, yeah. absolutely. I am um, the product manager for Camtasia Studio and Camtasia for Mac, and I work for TechSmith Corporation. So TechSmith is a software development company. We're based in Oklahoma, Michigan, and we basically develop um, software packages and um, services for people to be able to help them communicate visually and more effectively. So we um, include, make a lot of our products are especially used in the education field um, for teachers, both in K through 12 and higher ed, and then also for really making training, tutorial, um, demonstration type videos, as well as we make Snagit. So a lot of people may be familiar with that, which is a screen capture an image capture program that allows you to capture anything on your screen and share that easily and mark that up. And uh, so we're really all about helping people more effectively communicate visually and in the education field, helping teachers be more effective. So this is not a commercial, but we're, we're not going to ask you to not talk about the product. It's a part of the story here. Uh, is TechSmith sure. also, also the producer of Jing? Yes, we are. Okay. And Jing so is a big, free tool. Big fan. And I actually have a, a um, screencast account because we use it for the training for the Global Education Conference in order to have a pretty significantly large size video uh, be available for people to watch for the training. I'm getting some feedback that your microphone is coming in a little loud, Shane, so you may want to pull it away from your mouth just a bit or you can okay. lower the talk volume using the slider right above that talk button. Stacy, sure. so uh, let's talk a little bit about you and what you've done. The, the reason that I have referred to this idea of flipping the flipped classroom is that you're doing, you're doing one thing I really like, and then you're talking about doing a second that I care about as well. So the thing you're doing I really like is that you're creating your own videos. And the one that you're, at least in the news article I read that you're talking about, is having students create their own videos. So let me just say I'm really delighted to have you here. Thank you. So t tell us the story. I guess it started about three years ago. I was teaching AP Calculus, and on most days, when the end of the bell rang, I just felt like we had so much material to cover, and it felt kind of like we were on a huge treadmill going at full speed for 45 minutes. and it wasn't a pleasant way to end class. Um, I didn't feel like I had enough time to hear from my students or enough time for that inspiring classroom atmosphere that I went into teaching for. And so I knew I had a problem. And when I went to a summer conference, I learned about um, Camtasia Studio when I was there. And once I saw that, I knew that I had an answer to my problem because this would enable me to take the lecture outside of the classroom so that we could do more work in the class, more collaborative work, more problem solving together, and there would be more one-on-one -on -one time for me to work individually with the students. So I know people are going to want us to kind of drill down on the specifics of this. Um, but um, sort of before we do so, can we talk a little bit about the, the, the difference between sending students to watch uh, a Khan Academy video and sending them to watch a video that you've created? Um, what's the difference, and, and is that an important difference? For me, I really enjoy the whole design of the curriculum and, you know, creating the lecture, creating the classwork, and making it a full picture is very important to me. And by making my own videos, I'm able to customize that experience for my students as well. You know, they get to hear it exactly as I would say it in class. So any little, you know, kind of way that I would only say it, you know, something that I typically use the vocabulary, I typically use the language, I typically use, et cetera, that's also in the video. And so, 
you know, it sounds like they're a teacher. But at the same time, I, I do think that somebody who was taking short little clips from other videos and then, you know, putting this really nice story around it, you know, filling in the gaps, putting a beginning, putting an end, and putting that little video snippet in between, I think that would work rather effectively also if you didn't want to go creating all these videos. But I just think that that beginning and that end is really important to make that full picture for the students. Just throwing information and knowledge at the student without creating the story is is what would be missing potentially by using other videos. So give me some candid feedback here because I'm not a teacher. I, I'm in this sort of uh, interesting world of talking about education. Um, having uh, grown up in a, in a family that was deeply involved in education, being somebody who really cares, and someone who's um, homeschooled my, my children and volunteered in classes, you know, an active participant, but with that caveat, one of the things that has concerned me about the flipped classroom conversation is this idea that there's a best lecture or the best teacher. Um, does that language bother you? Am I overly sensitive to this? I I completely get where you're coming from. Um, to be honest, I think that the most important work, no matter if they're watching the video at home or if they're doing traditional homework at home, I think the most important part of, of any student's experience is what happens in the classroom. And so the question becomes, what do I need the most time for in my class? And to me, working individually with the students, building relationships with my students, building their trust, and getting to know how they're solving the problems, how they're thinking through their problems, that to me is the most important part of teaching. That's a teacher's most important role. And so I am able to have more time for that in my classroom by sending the lecture home. And so to me, that is the absolute most important part about it. I have more time to hear from my students. And and also, instead of me standing up at the front of the room every day and just driving the lesson, I go from their feedback. What did they have trouble with on the video? What did they not understand that well? What do they need help with that day? And so we roll with that. We still have a very lively discussion on the board. We're not taking that away. It's just more of a give and take now because they already have some knowledge coming into class. and. They're able to ask questions. They're able to initiate the discussion. And we're able to pinpoint their needs for the day as opposed to the content that I need to get through. Because the content that I need to get through is covered for homework. So one of the things I notice about the advent, especially of the, um, the handheld device and the camera getting incorporated into the handheld device, is that youth today are um, active creators in a way that wasn't true when I was in high school. Um, they're constantly taking photos or cre creating videos or other things that their peers see. And it is interestingly a world of creation for many of them, not for all of them, but for many of them. Is there a degree to which part of what you're doing is also modeling that you are willing to to do this, to to make the videos, to put yourself up there, to to not have them be perfect. Do you feel like a part of what you do extends beyond the math? Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's so important to model risk taking in general. And that's a hard thing. And I think it's especially a hard thing for a lot of teachers to do, do something where they're not certain that they're going to be a master of it. But how important is it that we demonstrate what being a learner is? You know, I think that our students look up to us so much and um, modeling that it doesn't always have to be perfect, that we mess up along the way, but we learn from those mistakes and get stronger. You know, it's, it's all about an iterative process of, of building. And um, 
it's it's a hard one to accept sometimes. The other day I did an online review with my students and I didn't know if it was going to work very well or not. And the first time we did it, there were little kinks, but the second time it was a lot better. But I, the students respond to that as well. So there, there's, there was some sort of very visible criticism of Sal Khan. Uh, was it for a math video where there were some concern that yeah. you had not actually explained something correctly? Uh, have you had to go back at any point and redo a video because you realized later that maybe you hadn't explained it well or it wasn't accurate? Um, I I haven't done that. I put I do really think my videos through before I I create a shell. I do it all through a PowerPoint and I create the examples and the lessons and um, I kind of make a unit at a time. I, a lot of times start with the test first and I think try and think about that big idea because again, um, my videos are a lot about or my my video making process is a lot about painting this full picture and making this beginning, middle and end. And I think a lot of the Khan Academy videos began as, you know, here's a little section that you need to review or, you know, because that's what they were for at the beginning to to help. Um just on a specific topic. And so I think I I do a little bit more of the painting the full picture. I hate in math to just explain one topic without context. So I try and paint that picture, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. So Shane, you're 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 going to get ignored a little at the beginning here as part of this story, but I don't want to. Uh, I know that you'll come in as we're talking about the practical, but maybe there are aspects of this, these first few questions that I've asked, where you've had a thought or you've you've encountered another educator who where you could add something here. Was there anything we've talked about here where you would want to add a thought or two? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I think. Um I just wanted to echo a lot of what Stacy said in terms of um, the educators, the other educators that we talk to and hear from a lot, and the fact about you were talking about the personalization and kind of that connection with the teacher, the student with their teacher, who their teacher is and who they're seeing in the classroom and who is using certain ways and methodologies and, and terms in the class or in, in the videos to help the student learn and that's true I think um, from other educators as well that that really helps the students engage better with the content when it's coming from you know their teacher they they understand who that is and they have that connection with that teacher and they know who they can go back to and ask for help later too if they don't understand something in the video that's coming from their teacher so we do see a lot of our um, customers and educators that are using um, other resources as well to supplement, like Stacy said, their content, but it really does help to have it come from the teacher who that student has a relationship with already, and they're seeing that teacher every day in the classroom. So when I, when I read about this being the, a route to personalization, um, I wasn't quite sure that I had the full picture that you've just given me, especially as you both talked about the relationship with the teacher. And Stacy, you said specifically sort of knowing where the class is and what the students might need. Um, but I did think about students being able to watch videos at their own speed or to watch them again. Um, is that would, would we call that a form of personalization, the fact that the material is accessible to them in a way that it previously wasn't? So let's have Stacy answer that if that's okay. Yeah, um, I think I usually call that more that they're customizable to the student. Um, usually, you know, I think about the support and the individualization that I can give in the classroom. But yeah, they're able to customize their instructions in multiple ways. Um, not just are they able to pause the video when they need to rewind the video and so forth, but they're also able to customize the instruction that happens in the classroom because now they are working on problems and they have the choice every day if they want to work in a group setting, if they want to work by themselves, or if they want to work with just one other person. And on different days, they have different needs. And um, they work at their pace or with their group pace you know, dependent on what they need. So I think there's a real customization to both the video viewing process, but also what their needs are in the classroom, what questions they need to get 
answered. Um, a lot of times I'll just do group work with the group that needs help, and if they need help, then they'll come to that table. Then sometimes we'll do it on the board as a class, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get at there's a lot of different ways that this is helping them customize. Also, I think that it gives them a lot of um, a big sense of independence and resourcefulness. Because they have all these tools at their fingertips, they begin taking ownership for their work. And I always say that that was the, one of the first things that I noticed when I started teaching like this. I was just amazed at how independent they were becoming in their learning. And it wasn't something that I had gone in with the real goal of. It was just it started happening on its own. and. It, it is quite amazing. Once you give them those resources, once you give them those tools, they really start running with them because, again, this is how they are starting to learn on their own. They go, they're used to going to YouTube if they don't know how to fix something. They're used to going to YouTube and learning how to fix a problem and stuff like that. So, so that would actually work for a video that you didn't make, a Khan Academy video feels like that's maybe a benefit that's enhanced by your making the videos. But I love that description. Um, and my guess is that that, that would be true of non-personalized or um, non, not, having, not having the videos come necessarily from your own teacher. Yeah, again, you know, students, they get pressed for time, and they like to know exactly what they need to do. It's not always as interesting a problem as what they would go and Google or find on YouTube. You know, sometimes the math problems are just problems that they have to learn, you know what I mean? So providing them the tools and the links and all of that stuff is really, really beneficial as opposed to just making them go out and, and look for, I guess, as you were saying before, like the best thing that they could find. But I know. We end up talking a lot about math when we talk about flipping the classroom. Um, you know, I, I had a, uh, we had a daughter who actually went into a math class each day where the math, <clears throat> the math was shown through PowerPoint, the lights were turned down, and the math was shown through PowerPoint, and it was a tremendously discouraging year for her. Is part of the reason that this is often talked about with regard to math because math is particularly challenging in certain ways as a teacher. I think that math is one of those classes where you're just you're really, really used to that traditional classroom environment where the teacher stands at the board and lectures and then students go home and do the problem. Um, I think I see more of it in the math classroom than any other classroom just through my own observation. And there's a lot of content that we need to get across. And um, there is some you know, I think a lot of teachers feel a real need to tell a lot of this information to the students. But um, in my opinion, standing at the board and telling the students all of this stuff and the questions that they asked during that time, I don't think that's an interactive discussion. And I think that's one of our major problems, that there's not true give and take. The questions that the students ask when a teacher is lecturing in the math classroom tends to be just clarifying questions. Like, what did you write up there? Or, you know, a little question that's not a deeper, higher order thinking question. I think by sending the lecture home and letting them kind of fumble through the difficult parts and wait till they get to the end and trying to then piece that together, and then coming into the classroom and having a full on discussion yeah, and for them to see it the second time around, I think that's the really powerful part about it because that's when it starts coming together. That's when the aha moments start happening and we can do that together in the classroom and then I'm there to guide that discussion. And so that's one of the most important parts, I think, about you know flipping the classroom is that your, your role as a teacher changes and it transforms completely from standing up at the board driving the discussion to being more of a learning coach and facilitating those discussions and listening to the students' ideas and helping guide them to thinking like a mathematician, you know? 
So I was at uh, a, a workshop this past weekend where one of the participants said that his motto had been, ask three before me. So ask three other students before yeah. you ask the teacher. Do you find that flipping the classroom um, has actually informed that the independence of searching for answers and, and that's involved with the students watching the videos outside of class has um, informed or changed what you do in that time that you've just described? Would you have done? Would you have used the same techniques in some am amount of free time that you'd have for student interaction the same way, or do you think you've actually changed how you do that interaction because of the independent factor? I think it also changes their frame of mind because there's more time and they're less, less stressed. You know, when there's 10 minutes at the end of class to ask five questions, they want to ask the expert in the room because they're pressed for time and they need an answer before they have to go home and do this assignment. But now that, you know, we have maybe 40 minutes for them to get their questions answered, they ask a, a classmate before they would even ask me. They do that on their own because they would rather ask a classmate a lot of times than ask me. And a lot of times they don't ask me at all, and it's not until I fumble in on their discussion that I, you know, I start participating in whatever conversation they're having, and that's where I'm able to guide them. But um, most certainly they are asking each other questions because of this time. And one other thing that I always say is I think it's amazing that um, there's this sense of calm because the students think that I'm there or they know that I'm there um, when they're doing the problems. And that's when they think they're going to need to ask me a million questions. And they never end up asking me a million questions. But just that sense of calm, because they know that they're doing that work in class, I think it really helps them think at that higher level. I, you know, think in more classes than any other one, you hear of students freezing on a math test and not being able to think. And it is an actual real problem. And I think a lot of it just comes from they stress out so much. And a lot of my students, you know, I pick this up at the school that I'm in, you know, they're high achieving students and they want to do so, so well. And sometimes I'll see them really panic under that stress situation and not be able to think clearly through the problem. And that's where that higher order thinking comes in. So by reducing some of that stress in the classroom, I really believe that is what is the driver behind some of the increased results that I've seen. So Shane, I've heard of all kinds of classes flipping. Can mm -hmm. you give us any examples of classes other than math and maybe even some fun ones where you've seen uh, some benefits from flipping the classroom? Sure, um, absolutely. Well, there's a good example is uh, Clintondale High School, which is is a an example of a class or a high school that flipped their entire school, and so every subject has flipped their English, um, science, social studies. Um, I've seen even my daughter is um, that has a social studies class in middle school that has been flipped to where she watches the lectures at home, and I've even seen um, a spelling teacher has done this with spelling, making spelling videos for even. Um, elementary school kids where she would draw, using a tablet, kind of draw a picture of an animal like a cat and then have them, you know, uh, spell it out for them and then have them um, be able to follow along and, and pronounce that out as she was spelling those letters and the words out for them. So it's really can be applied to, I think, any subject and teachers are using it across the board. And I think the real benefit there is because that gives them more time in class to work directly with the students to be there to answer their questions and help them solve the problems when they're when they're available and in that class time. So yeah, there's some really good examples. Um, even science is a really good one too, and chemistry has been um, a popular one as well. And it's really because, in a lot of ways, the experiments they can show in video and uh, are really um, can be very interesting and much more visual to engage the student into watching those and seeing what happens during those experiments. So. Um, Aaron Sams and John Bergman are a couple of teachers that have done that where they were 
they recorded their experiments and kind of played off each other. So it's it's effective too when you have can have a couple teachers work together on producing some of that content as well because then they can help each other and play off of each other a little bit um, in those videos. So it's been used in a lot of different subjects. So I want to talk a little bit about how this is actually practically done and then maybe about some pushback that we hear within the community about flipping the classroom. But before we do so, I want to make sure that we've talked about uh, all of the potential benefits or as many as we can think of. Two that occurred to me that have, we haven't discussed, um, w one would be test prep and the ability to go back and review. And, and another would be parent help. Uh, as a parent, my ability to watch that video would probably significantly increase my ability to help my student. Stacy, are those accurately described as benefits? Yeah. I think especially with the AP Calculus, having the video resource going into the AP exam, you need to review some of the topics um, very specifically is very helpful. And as far as parents go, um, I haven't seen much of it with the AP Calculus, especially their 11th and 12th graders. But um, I've used some videos in my Algebra 1 class, and now I'm using them in my Algebra 2 class this year, and most certainly um, parents are using them. And I, I this year had one parent who watched a whole chapter of the videos and then reviewed certain ones with a student who was struggling, and it made a huge difference. Um, and, you know, it's a great way to, like, this father actually sat down with a child and they watched a couple of the videos. There were only two of them that I thought that student really needed to reveal. And they sat down together and they watched that and they went through it and, and so forth. And so that's so wonderful, you know, to give, so directly give a parent a tool to be able to help their child. Okay, there's some great, wonder. go ahead, Shane. I was ahead. just going to say, as a parent, as, you know, my daughter um, going through middle school, has been, you know, having a, only a couple of her classes have had have used the flip model, so she's had a lot of homework that she's needed to do at home and often has needed some help during that process. And so as I've tried to help her, it's been really interesting because the way things are taught now, from when I went through school, is often very different. And they're, they're trying to teach new ways of learning and help the students learn more than just specifically how to solve a problem in the most direct way, but multiple ways to solve problems. And so it becomes real challenging even for me um, to be able to help her, Not obviously not even going through that stuff in many, many years, um, but also the fact that it's taught in many ways very differently than it was um, when I was in school. So having the video, when the video is available, makes that much easier for me to understand what, how they're teaching it as well so I can help um, facilitate that learning. So uh, I think, Shane, a couple of times your connection must have slowed down because we got this little chipmunking factor where we hear your voice speed up to catch you up. So if, if we oh. pause before Hello? getting back to you, it's because That's of that. No, you're sound, good. I think. It's just a delay, and it's typically because of now. Stacy, you can see some red dots next to Shane's microphone, which means his internet connection <laughs> is low enough. He's probably going to drop off. If you drop off, Shane, just log back on, and we'll bump you up to be moderator. Okay, so um, Stacy, would it help to show a video as we start the discussion of how you actually do this? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to take us to the main site, and, or the main uh, sort of folder here. And let's make sure that this comes up for everybody. And if you want to tell me which one to click on, I can click on one and we can watch it. Oh, goodness. I don't know. Um, the, I'm pretty sure that 4.9 one is short. So maybe that would be a good one. <laughs> I'm not sure. What if we agree we'll just watch 60 seconds and then we'll come back? Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. So many of you are likely to have to hit play here. So go ahead and hit play.
again. Okay, well, if nothing else, that really showed me how little I've retained of my own math. <laughs> I couldn't see it, so <laughs> I'm lost as to what you just watched. <laughs> oh, so what, do you, uh, um, what happened on your screen? Nothing. It was white. Oh, that's interesting. So the way that I the Blackboard Collaborate... <laughs> the way Blackboard Collaborate work works for me either, so... Oh, really? It worked perfectly for me. Uh, oh, that's too bad. So uh, I wonder why that would be. Typically, the technology here uses the the default browser for the user's computer, and I'm on a Windows machine and saw it. But let's put a link to that. I'm going to put the link into the chat for those who want to go on your own. And and uh, I, does, I guess it doesn't matter which one you watch, but the link is no. there. No, yeah. I I think that that one actually was very, un, like, not fancy at all. I can't, um, I should have thought of a good video to watch. But, I mean, they're all pretty much the same. I think that the main thing that I think is really valuable is in that I create that on that PowerPoint, which you saw, and then I hand out a hard copy of that PowerPoint to my students ahead of time. So when you saw me inking on the screen and as I was talking through things, I, the expectation is that the students are taking notes as they're watching that and then they're pausing when they need to and rewinding when they need to. Um, my expectation is a video takes nearly two times the length of whatever the video to watch it full length for the AP Calculus students. Um, maybe one and a half times, but maximum it would take two times that length. And so, by having them take notes on that PowerPoint, first of all, I think that really helps them retain it. I don't think that you can just watch something, especially in math. I don't think that you can just watch it and understand what's going on. There's real power in writing. And also, they bring that PowerPoint to class with them. So when they come to class, the first thing they do is put that PowerPoint on their desk. So while I'm walking around, I look for completion that they've had that PowerPoint um, filled out. And also, that's their notes for the day. So as they go through the problems, they're looking back through the PowerPoint to remind themselves how to approach the problems that they're solving. So you're giving them advice on how to, it sounds like from what you've just described, on how to participate with the videos. You're saying they need, they need to be taking notes because that will make it for a better learning experience for them? Now, that two times figure that you gave, that's the amount of time you expect it will take them to actually watch the video, or that's the amount of time it takes you to prepare the video? That's how, that's the maximum amount of time I would assume that it would take them to watch the video. Okay. And how long does it take you to prepare a video? <laughs> it, that depends. Um, on how much editing I decide to do. Um, it, you know, I, I make the PowerPoint ahead of time, then I, I record, and then I have to go back and edit it. So editing it requires me to watch the entire video and then edit as I'm going along. So that rewatching process takes about two times. Um, the amount of time that the video was in the first place that I recorded. But, you know, Again, I am making these videos and editing them and trying to make, you know, this nice product for my students to watch. But then these videos are going to be recycled, you know, for these AP Calculus videos I made before. I'm not remaking them now. Um, and then I can edit them as I go on if I want to add something in or anything like that. That's the nice thing that I have, that editing ability by using the software, you know, I, I can do that as opposed to just putting out a video, the first thing that comes to mind and not being able to edit. Um, so I go for a little bit more time now, but I think it saves me a lot of time later. It also occurs to me that, um, that when you get to the place of students making videos for each other, this whole game will change a little. 
One of my favorite interviews I've ever done was with the university language program where they had the fourth year language students making videos for the first year students. And even though there was a recognition that there had to be you know, more sort of back and forth on what was right and what wasn't, but that naturally occurred as the students watched because they understood that this, the older students might make mistakes. But there was this tremendous opportunity for learning through teaching. And I've, I've got to imagine that's sort of the next step and that kind of could potentially shift all of this. Yeah, I, I love what you just said, that the power of students teaching students and what they learn through teaching one another is just amazing. And that is, you know, part of the, the amazing thing with creating this class time is that my students now have time to make videos. And in addition to being a resource for other students, I think it's also an amazing opportunity for me to hear how the student's approaching the problem while I get to watch, you know, them work in class and I get to see their steps on the homework problem, I don't always get to hear every step of the way. Um, when I ask them to create a video, and I would love to in the future make this a better assessment tool because I think there's power in that also, um, but I get to hear how they think through the problem and where they're fumbling and where it's not clicking immediately. and that's a great feedback tool for me to then go and sit down with the student and allows me to target a problem before a test happens. So that's another another tool, the assessment tool that I think I'll get to, you know, using that more effectively in the future. So I, it would probably be helpful, and, I'm, and I hope you'll indulge us in this, Stacy, and then Shane, maybe you can comment afterwards, to kind of just describe for us exactly what takes place. You have to map out what you want to describe. You're creating a PowerPoint. You're going to a computer and you're recording. If you'd give us a couple of minutes of sort of detail there, that'd be helpful. And somebody in the chat noticed that there wasn't really a full answer to the actual length of time, although you said it varies. But you said there's sort of two times of watching afterwards, and then you're willing to invest the time in advance. But there wasn't actually a sort of a concrete figure. Uh, yes. <laughs> can, you, can you give a concrete figure? Is it so high that you're a little embarrassed? I am definitely embarrassed. Um, I mean, they never take me less than two hours to make a video. It was probably two hours, I would say two to two and a half hours to make a, well, yeah, to make a 20-ish minute video, if I'm including, you know, the time to prepare the PowerPoint and so forth. That doesn't seem bad to me. Okay, so <laughs> so walk us through it now. So the, you have an idea you, of something. How do you decide first what content you're going to put in the video? Is it specific to the next lesson coming up? And then walk us forward from there, sort of exactly what you do. I. I actually start with, um, in the summer, I lay out, I laid out my entire course. So I used the summer to really map out what I wanted to cover, and that's when I created the PowerPoints and the test. Um, I made one chapter videos during the summer. Um, this is my process that I used for both of the classes. Um, I'm speaking specifically about the Algebra 2 class right now um, because I'm doing it as we go along. This is my first year doing that class. And so I made a, a unit of videos and then I really waited until I was teaching the class to finish the rest of them because I wanted to get the feedback from the students and hear what they liked about them, what they didn't like, and what I needed more time for. So. I'm creating the videos. The, my process now is I already have the PowerPoints made. I kind of already designed the course. And now I'm just pretty much doing the lecture that I would have done in the classroom and I'm making it through video. The way I do that is I have a tablet PC and I have Camtasia Studio. And so I use my PowerPoint and I use the inking capabilities on that with my pen technology, and then I use Camtasia Studio to record. Once I've finished recording, 
I use, again, I still use Camtasia Studio to go back and edit everything. Um, something that I really, really love is the editing process because it allows me to do things such as zoom in on things that I need to. It also allows me to add in call outs and I think that's very powerful, much like a textbook has, you know, um, a box around a definition or something that you want to draw focus in on. I can add out call out boxes and I don't mean just for definitions because I don't think that's the most important part, but the call out boxes to really draw attention to something that I'm trying to say. So I capture the visual learners. Um, as well, you know, I'm writing and they're writing at the same time when they're watching in that process. Finally, um, I'm also using quizzing with my Algebra 2 videos. So um, you're, you're able to use embedded, sorry, embedded quizzes. And so I can pop in quizzes when I want to ask a quick question and that's a way for me to interact with my students through the video and also to gain some feedback before they come to class. So that's kind of my video making process. Okay, this is so fun. And uh, as a courtesy to our guests, we always finish on time, which means we only have about 13 minutes left. Shane, can you add anything to that? Are there other things that you've seen um, educators do that you feel would be worth adding to that description? Oh, you know, we lost Shane, and I've never made him a moderator again, so he may be back in the room. Hang on. I don't see him. He oh, may have man. actually lost the connection. Okay, if he comes oh, back he in. Is he, he back now? Yes. Okay, let's see. Well, he will not have heard he could, that. He could talk uh, much more um, about Shane. We were just talking about the call-outs and quizzing. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Shane, actually, I'm gonna, that. Oh, well, I'm going to move on, and then we can add at the end. And, sure. and why don't I suggest that both of you, if you're willing, put your email addresses in the chat so if people have specific questions. Because I want to get sure. quickly to some of the pushback, because I think you'll both have valuable things to say. And again, we do, as a courtesy, finish on time, so we know we're not going to cover everything, but we'll cover what we can. Okay, so um, uh, Stacy, talk to me about uh, your colleagues. Um, is there fear involved here? Is there a concern about time? Um, what percentage of the teachers that you work with do you think would feel positive about this and would, would want to do it themselves as well? Um. I think that, I think one thing is that it's important to embrace the way that you teach as, as we want to kind of differentiate for students needs. I think that there's different teaching styles and there's a lot of great teachers out there. And so, um, you know, I'm just thinking about a couple of math teachers in my department who are awesome at what they do. and. I don't know if this style would fit them that well, to be honest. And so, um, it, to me, the most important question to ask, or the question that I ask myself is, what do I need more time for in my classroom? And, you know, what do I need that face-to-face -face time with my students most for? And I didn't feel like I was, ha I didn't feel like I had enough time for that. And so, for me, this was a way of, getting that lecture outside of the classroom. You know, there's so many other teachers, like look at look at Dan Myers or something who asks, you know, these questions that really get them asking the questions and stuff like that. And I think he makes time in his class by doing it in a different way. So I'm not I don't think that there's any one size fits all, but I think that videos can be used in a lot of different ways. They don't have to be used to front load. They can be used at the end, um, depending on your style of teaching. And so um, I think if you put it in terms of, okay, you have to make a video that is a front-loaded video that students watch for homework and then they come into class and they do like problem solving, I think then it's going to be poorly received by anybody and I think it should be because I don't think that is 
the way it has to happen. I think that the videos are just another tool that we're providing for our students. And when you put it that way, I think that you're making, you know, you're fitting into a lot more teachers' style and allowing them to kind of go with what they're most talented with, you know, and you don't need to make a video every day. Make a couple videos. Make, you know, five of them. Use some other people's videos that you love. Go to TED Ed and look at some of those awesome things that they're putting out. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about that. Stacy, do you feel any awkwardness seeing yourself on video? A lot of people say, <laughs> I just can't even, I can't stand to look at myself. Does that well, ever I happen? My face on it. <laughs> my face is not on it. So they just see my screen. But um, it was so awkward hearing my voice all the time. Like if students were watching it in the study hall or they were watching it in the hall, it was so awkward at first and now I've gotten a little more used to it. <laughs> What about the Hawthorne argument, which is sort of any change in education is bound to produce some increased energy and interest for a period of time that will then diminish. Is this a turning point? Is the ability to put video on the web and make it easily accessible more than just a bump because of a change? I think it's just about, you know, being the best teacher you can be and finding a way to be the best support. And to me, it's this whole process is about being there to support my students to really make my classroom, to transform the classroom culture to a calmer, more supportive, more inspiring place. And to me, that's what it's all about. And so I, I kind of hate to use the term flipping because now it's like a thing as opposed to just being the best teacher you can be and thinking about how your class time can most effectively be used and then embracing whatever technology or whatever tools in general can help you get there. Stacy, I don't want you to get uh, to feel overly complimented here, but I, uh, I have to tell you, I think that's a really thoughtful and compelling way to describe what you're doing, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, someone in the chat asked about, isn't this just another form of homework? You called it homework 2.0. Is that a danger? Um, it doesn't have to be homework. This can happen in the classroom, too. I, I'm really pressed for time and that this was my solution, but in, when I was doing this in Algebra 1, videos were watched in the classroom so that I had more time to work one-on-one -on -one with students on a day that I needed it, and also it provided me a way to watch how they were taking in lecture, and that helped me I had a lot of students with um, some learning support and stuff like that, and I was able to address some of um, the ways that they could improve their study habits. So it doesn't have to be homework. What about students who don't have access to technology? It's a good question. It's uh, And honestly, it's not an issue um, at my school at all. Um, but one of the things is that um, you can put them all, like all my videos are also available on iTunes. And so if you subscribe to the podcast, even if you don't have internet at home and you have a device, then you could, wherever you have internet access, it would automatically be downloaded so you don't need internet when you're watching it at home. But I know other teachers have used, have even burned DVDs for the students of the videos, and then they just watch it on a DVD player. So I really think there are ways around it, and I think that that um, divide will be lessening, you know. Yeah, okay, we've seen that with uh, like Clintondale, especially as a, an at-risk, was an at-risk school, and so, you know, the students didn't always have access to technology, but what they did was make, make additional time available in school for them to come in and get access to computers to watch the video content. Um, so they they just provided and worked out ways to provide time outside of class, even in the building and resources in the building to help those students that didn't have access at home to technology to be able to use technology to watch those, that video content. Lovely. Stacy, one of the articles I read mentioned that your mom is also a math teacher. Am I getting that right? Yes. 
Okay, so have you ever had a conversation with her about sort of this generation of students? It seems like there's this cultural conflict. They're either the dumbest generation or mm -hmm. they are sort of uniquely adapted to the technologies. Uh, with a two-generation math teaching family, can you give us a sense of how you view sort of the moment, this, the, the opportunities of social technology, what your students are like, and is there a way to kind of describe this generation? Hmm. That's a difficult question. Um, I think the I think the biggest thing is just the difference, at least what we talk about, is the difference in their attention span and um, what they're used to. And they're so used to multitasking and having so much stimulation um, all going on at once, they have a harder time just sitting and focusing and listening to a lecture. Um, and so I think that's one of the of the main things that that we talk about. We also talk a lot about you know what skills they need because that's changing too with computers available they it's more it's very important that we help them become more innovative and these deeper thinkers as opposed to just being able to, you know, drill and multiply numbers and do long division. So the skill set is also changing. So I don't know. Your question has a lot a lot to it. <laughs> so Seymour Peppert said that if we lived in math land, math was the language. Everybody would learn math. Just like if you live in France, you learn French, or you live in the United States, you learn English or Spanish. What, what what do you think? Is there a math brain? Are there students who have a, a greater facility in learning math, or uh, do we overblow that? And and is everybody is this a valuable thing for everybody to be doing? I think that math is a valuable skill in that I think it just develops those logical thinking skills. It's just like, to me, math is just like putting a puzzle together and figuring out how those pieces go together. I do, I do think that it comes easier to some people. I think that I, I know that the way I approach math, I see it very, very visually. And when I talk to other people, that's not the same way that they do problems. And it's my real goal to help my students see math in the way that I do because I don't memorize anything. It just makes sense. And that's the beauty of math to me. So yes, I think it comes more naturally to some students, but I also think there's a lot of power in the way that you learn the basics and the foundations, and that's why I'm a math teacher. And you obviously had some benefit from your mom being a math teacher, either yes. genetic or cultural, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, both my parents are math brains, so yeah, it kind of comes up in conversations around the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, last comments? I just was going to say, I think what you're talking about, you're going to learn from if you were engulfed in math all the time, but what the flipped model really does, I think, is enable that classroom environment to become much more a a rich environment of that subject for the teacher to help the students, the students to help each other in small groups, but that te the teacher can become more involved in doing that rather than, um, you know, just hoping they're soaking everything in that they're saying and then going home and, and knowing how to do it. Stacy, final word? Um, I don't know, just, you know, I think that Everything we've talked about tonight is just what I love most in, you know, being, bringing back the, you know, being that compassionate teacher and having the time to listen to your students and get to their individual needs. And I think that what we've talked about tonight is one way of getting there. Thank you both so much. Shane, the chat is saying you've got short shrift tonight. I apologize. But thank you both for coming on. So lovely to hear from both of you. Yeah, thank you very much for having us, Steve. No problem. Thank Don't you. Miss, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Don't miss Gina Bianchini tomorrow night and Ray McNulty on Thursday.
most appreciate uh, your attendance tonight. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day or night, depending on where you are. Bye now.